Right, so good evening. Thank you for staying with us on The Big Story. 29 individuals, including Treasury CS Henry Rotich and his PS, will spend the night in police cells uh, waiting to be arraigned in court today over Aurora and Kimware dam scandal. Remember, these are two dams that have caused a storm in the political uh, arena with different political leaders, different individuals just weighing in on what exactly happened with the dam. So that's the conversation we're having today with the arrest of the Treasury CS. We are having this conversation with Mudomi Thiankolu, who's a lawyer, he'll be joining us from Upper Hill. We'll also be speaking to XN Iraqi, who's an economist, who's joining us from Mombasa. Iraqi, let me begin with you, and thank you for joining us on The Big Story. So listening in to Amani leader, Musale Mudavadi, says this is a significant development in the fight against corruption. We've had a conversation about the fight of uh, um, the fight against corruption in the Republic of Kenya for quite a while now. The president at some point sounding really frustrated, saying, Munataka nifanye nini. So this is the high profile, first high profile individual to actually be arrested. He's getting to spend the night in police cells, will be presented tomorrow in court. From where you sit, how significant is this? Good evening, Kenyans from the coastal city of Mombasa. I think when I saw those news in the morning, breaking news, it took me by surprise for a number of reasons. One, it was a surprise. I don't think anybody expected what happened this morning. Number two, the CS in charge of Treasury or Finance is not any other ministry. It is the heart and the heartbeat of the country or the, minister of the, the, or the government. So that was very significant. And if I was in the government, I would be very concerned about it. Number three, once the, three, the 29 individuals have been indicted and they have to go to court tomorrow morning, they will be taken to the court, to the due process, they will go through the due process to either identify them as guilty or not guilty. But even before they go to the legal court, we also must look at the economic court. I was this morning looking at how the economy is reacting to the arrest or to the indictment of the 29. And I was very surprised that the sharing and the boards are reacting negatively. Instead of cheering, they actually went down, which is a very significant information as far as that particular episode is concerned. But I hope that in the long run, it's going to be about the legal process, the due process, not the cheer reading and so on. Justice should be assured in this issue because if justice is not done, people may not get the justice they need. And tomorrow you might be the next person. So we are hoping that, as Musari and Budava had put it, the due process is going to be followed and we are going to find who is guilty and who is not guilty in this big economic issue. But he also says, let's look at the facts. You can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Musalam David also said, let's look at the facts. And this is the perfect place to bring in Mudomi Thiankolu, who's the lawyer. Mudomi, good evening. Thank you for joining us on The Big Story. So I was listening in to your colleague, Kipchumba Murkomen, who's the leader of majority in the Senate. And he says, this is Ashered. I mean, I've looked at, at the charges being leveled against these individuals. As a matter of fact, this is about uh, the succession politics. It has nothing to do with the charges that are being leveled against these individuals. So once you start having that conversation in a case like this, touching on a, ma a man um, to the caliber of the CS Treasury, then that's a problem. Mudomi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Linda. Of course, uh, it's a problem to suggest that um, uh, these changes are part of uh, succession politics. It doesn't surprise me that our politicians would want to spin uh, or rather make some political spin out of this. For me, it's a, it's a long shot. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Henry Rotich is not vying to be president. Uh, in the year 2022, he has not uh, declared any intention of vying for any other office. And uh, in any event, uh, I just don't see even if you are vying. Does it mean if somebody has political interest in 2022, therefore they are immune to the legal processes of this country? But to me, it's just political posturing, uh, nothing much, and, and I don't think those are those passions. Uh, should be taken too seriously. Having said that, of course, we have previously uh, in this show said that um, the DPP ought to be very careful in a country like ours 
and given the timing of uh, this uh, uh, resuscitated fight against corruption, because what happens is um, fights like this, a campaign like this one to purge corruption, as uh, political players will take advantage of it, they will position themselves for it. And what happens uh, if you're not very careful as the DPP or as the state or even the president who seems to be the one spearheading this purge, is that um, political operators start then uh, using the fight against this corruption as a political weapon so that people are fixed, uh, politically speaking, using the criminal process based on their real or perceived political inclination. And it has always been a danger in Kenya. What I don't know is uh, whether the state has uh, given this dynamic the seriousness that it deserves. Because in my view, anyone who has a the keen eye, you don't need to be very intelligent to see that there is a way in which these uh, arrests uh, to, today has happened on Monday, they have usually happened on Fridays, but there is a way anyone who has an eye can see that um, the people who tend to be subjected to this process uh, are invariably people who are either uh, perceived to be aligned to the deputy president uh, or people perceived to be sympathetic to his 2022 ambitions. Whether those perceptions are of course true or not, uh, we, we will not know. Uh, all I know is that uh, we should expect the politicians to come uh, making all manner of UN cries saying this is a political witch and this is a political warfare and whatnot. Okay. And even as you talk about perceptions, Mudomi, I understand uh, the concern that someone would have that perhaps the people who are being targeted are, have an inclination towards the president, William Ruto. Iraqi, looking at the whole Arod and Kimore dam scandal, let's forget the political inclination. Let's forget about um, the cheerleading with the arrest and everything. That entire process, there are several issues that came to the fore that perhaps may explain why we are now seeing what we are seeing. For example, I know for a fact that... Um, an advisory opinion um, uh, by the then Attorney General of the Republic of Kenya was disregarded. Um, you've had talks about um, individuals refusing to give up their land, and you had um, some. You have you've had facts that at some point money was paid for work not done. Um, so the company in question comes and says we've done our assessment as well. So from an economic point of view, at what point did individuals in this entire uh, scandal drop ball professionally? I think this is something that should be determined by the legal process mm. because if you look at such a big project like building dams that awards 60 billion and so on, mm. you, have, you have to go through a number of steps. You have to, they have to go through the bidding process, then people have to bid, the bids are, the bids are evaluated, the bids then the bids are, then the winner is announced. Uh, and the winner must start doing his work within a given period of time. So, so one of the things we must do in this particular case is to find out from the time the bid was announced up to the time the bid was won, who dropped the eyes off or who failed his duties. And I think that's, that's why you can see clearly that in this particular case, we don't know who was culpable. We don't know who was it not, who did not do his work or not, or not. So it's very important for the legal process, for us to go through the legal process and determine who failed his duties. For now, all these 29 gentlemen, I think they are, there might be a radio or two, are just suspects. We don't know who failed to do his work. And that's what the legal process is going to do. For now, we cannot determine. Now, uh, we've had several cases of corruption in this country, but there are those who now say that perhaps the arrest of Treasury CS Henry Rotich, the fact that he's spending the night in police cells, is the beginning of the onslaught on the fight against corruption. Is this it from where you sit, um, from both the DPP side and DCI? I know there have been several other cases as well, and that is directed to you, Iraqi. I, I think if you look at it from, uh, from his position, See, cyborically, it appears that the beginning of a big fight in corruption because nobody else as big as him has been taken to court. 
But what we are going to be watching as time goes by is who else is going to be sucked in into this saga? Because I don't think that the whole episode about corruption is about one person. It is even has an international dimension. So what we are going to be watching is who else is going to be sucked in? What new information is going to come in? And then at the end of the day, we are going to find out who failed, who did not fail. Who took the money, who did not take money. For now, I don't think we have sufficient information to say who was right and who was wrong. So I expect this to be a long, protracted rigor and definitely suck in some politicians. As Mudavadi, Musari Mudavadi said, I would want less entertainment, but I would, want, I would want more facts so that justice is expedited as soon as possible. Because if we leave the Treasury, the Minister of Finance, exposed like that, it's not good for our country, it's not good for the public, it's not good for anybody. We expect justice to be expedited as soon as possible. Okay, let's see how that goes. We're still waiting for a word on whether or not uh, Treasury CS Henry Rotich will be replaced any, any time from now. Um, I did mention at his latest State of the Nation address, President Uhuru Kenyatta did mention that the moment you are charged in court for <clears throat> corruption, you may have to step aside. Mudomi, um, so looking at the charges facing Henry Rotich, at the beginning of this show, I did play a bite by Deputy President William Ruto, and there was that contradiction on the amount of money that has been lost. Deputy President was saying seven billion, uh, DPP was saying 21. So from where you sit, how does this, or where does this leave Deputy President William Ruto? I don't think uh, one I'm a lawyer may not able to comment authoritatively on uh, political statements like those made by the uh, deputy president. My own view is that uh, he should not have made those remarks because given the office he occupies, uh, by making the statements he made, then he appeared like a man who has an interest uh, at a personal level in the outcome of uh, these investigations and prosecutions. But there is an important question you asked, Professor Iraqi, which is whether the arraignment of uh, Henry Rotich then is the beginning of uh, us seeing uh, corruption being uh, tackled at the highest levels. In my view, it is not. And I've told you several times in this show that view it's uh, not. corruption... The, it is not, in my view, it's just theatrics, because the problem of corruption in Kenya is a structural problem. You don't address a structural problem by dealing with the symptoms and uh, the manifestations of that problem, but you go to the structure and ask yourself, why is it that corruption is so deep-rooted in the Kenyan society and in Kenyan psyche? And until we start seeing serious thinking, serious strategic interventions, for me, the value of charging people or arresting people at the level of Henry Rotich is tokenist. It's just a token. I mean, it's a lynch, perhaps because the public is so agitated to start seeing the so-called big fish get arrested, maybe on a Friday like is usually the case, spend the night in police cells and whatnot. To me, that is the dramatic elements of the so-called fight against corruption. Uh, in my view, you have to go to the prevailing policies if you're serious about fighting corruption. You have to revisit the structural soundness of the existing legal uh, frameworks. You have to go to the scheme of uh, punishments and rewards that uh, the law establishes for corruption. In short, Linda, as we've said a million times before, there are so many structural things the government has not even considered or touched and therefore it will be too hasty. Of course, for a simple mind, seeing a high-ranking government officer arrested, spend the night in the police cells, to a very simple uh, Sunday school mind, that is a, a, a very huge sign that the government yeah. is doing something serious about corruption. But if you ask anyone who has a brain and who has studied this problem <laughs> at a serious level, yeah. they'll tell you it's purely the tokenism. Yeah. We need to see much more at a structural level. Okay, hold on. Stay with me because I want you to listen to what the president said at his last State of the Nation address. Can we listen to that? Whose case goes before court will be removed from government and any individual... <laughs> ...will thereafter have to answer his case before a court of law. Mudomi Fiancolo, 
do you think Treasury CS Henry Rotich should step aside? Direct question. Uh, it's, it's a very hard question to say yes or no. Uh, if you're asking it as a matter of principle, yes, he should step aside. Uh, perhaps if you're asking it as a simple question of law, then the answer is that he should step aside. Uh, and actually, there is no such thing as stepping aside. Actually, all you should be asking is whether he should resign or relinquish uh, public office. The simple legal answers and uh, the answers of principle is that he should. Uh, but it's not that straightforward because we have also seen people being outed out of public office only to be acquitted in the long run. And that's what I meant when I said it's a very dicey game because uh, even as you want to fight corruption, we must remember that all these people are alleged to have done this or that. There is always a chance that they could be found to have been innocent and uh, to have been a victims of which and to have been a victims of even a genuine mistake. I mean, the DPP could move in, in good faith but still be mistaken uh, on the reasons why he has decided to arrest and to prosecute a particular person. It happens every day. Uh, if we think of it as a public office to which nobody can say it's their birthright, then the answer is simple. You don't need to think about it. He should step aside. He should resign. If you're looking at it from a broader fairness question, should we, every time we shout that so-and-so is a thief, so-and-so is corrupt, without even interrogating the merits of that allegation, does it mean that someone should step aside? And I think it would be a very dangerous thing to approach from a black and white approach to, a, to approach from a yes and no. And I believe that's why even our law is not very clear if you check the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act. There are certain cadres of public officers who are not required to automatically leave public office uh, merely because they've been charged with this or other offense. It is to appreciate that uh, sometimes the dynamics are too complex to be approached from a yes and no perspective. But my own personal view, this is not a legal view, my personal view is that uh, when someone is facing these sort of challenges, uh, they should not be dragging the public office they hold into them. They should step aside. When they are cleared, they receive their cleared. Then now they can come. Okay. Then uh, the appointing authority will return them. Yes. Iraqi, in 30 seconds, the way forward in the fight against corruption in the Republic of Kenya. It's, it's very unfortunate that at around uh, 8.49 p.m., the whole, the whole country is grewed on issues of corruption. It's very unfortunate. We should be talking of bigger things, more progressive things, not corruption. But that happens to be where we are, that corruption has become a millstone on the country's necks. So I talked about, I agree with Mr. Modombi that we need to have some structural adjustment in the way the regal system is, is, is the, the, the way the regal system is. We need to change our culture. We need to change our thinking. We need to change our incentive system. Because one reason why people are corrupt is sometimes they don't feel they are incentivized enough for the work that is done. But you must balance the carrot and the, the stick. Because a lot of people are going to be sacrificed because of uh, long reasons. So as we fight corruption, we must be fair. We must use the legal system. We must make sure that people are not victimized. Because at the end of the day, corruption is perpetrated by, by Kenyans. It must, it, and the corruption will only be added, be added by Kenyans. It is not Ugandans or Tanzanians or other people who come and be corrupt in this country. It is you and me, your brothers and sisters. So if you have solved this problem, it may, must be solved by Kenyans. Okay. Right. We have to look at the legal system, the way we educate people, and everything else. I hear you. So basically from both of you, let's use the legal system. Let's not victimize individuals. Thank you so much for being part of the big story this evening. Um, Udomi Thiankolu, lawyer, who has been speaking to us from Upper Hill. A very big thank you as well to XN Iraqi and Economist who was speaking to us from Mombasa. A big thank you to NC leader Musale Mudavadi who spoke to our lead reporters of Hewanuna. I'm Linda Ogutu. Thank you for watching The Big Story. <laughs>